All right, looks like we're started. So today we have a workshop, everybody, from Stidl. It's going to be a workshop and an AMA. So just for some information about our work, about their keynote. And so, okay, so their workshop's name is Beyond the Code, Branding Your Technology. It'll be an interactive workshop where a new business idea is randomly generated to Cheris and James, and then they will create a brand around the idea, designing the logo, social media, establishing a mission, as well as purpose, and then maybe some UI UX design later. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to them, and they can get started with their keynote. All right, perfect. Thank you, Mahir. Um, yeah, so hi, uh, thanks for, for joining us with Dev Hacks. And um, I'm James Bender and I'm Chara Zane. And we're the co founders of Still. Um, so let me hop into, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and we'll hop into the presentation here. Um, let's see here. Hopefully we're all up on here. Um, okay, great, great. So, um, so yeah, so without further to do here, here we are. So, um, we're going to be hosting our, our workshops on branding your technology through the power of design, um, specifically tech based and, and branding, uh, branding your technology. So let's get started. Yeah. So first we just wanted to talk about our agenda for the day. Um, just run through our course of action. First, we'll be picking an idea. Uh, which we've already done to save time and you know since it's a less interactive workshop than we hope it will be due to some complications earlier today um, we'll just run with it and then we'll be finding a name for the specific idea checking our domain availability doing some logo designs um, come up with a company slogan and then finally we're going to go into consumer psychology and really deep dive into the little twists here and there that we can implement in our brand to make our uh, brand persona better. Right, so first we're gonna come up with an idea. Um, and, we, you know, as, as Cheris and I were, were discussing this workshop last week coming up, coming up the workshop, um, we decided to use a word generator, a random word generator. And our idea, um, our word for the idea was uh, was airplane, and that's the word that the generator gave us. So with that, we decided, okay, airplane. Well, what do airplanes generally do, right? We know that they fly, we know that they carry people, and we know that they they land, right? So that's where we came into a landing page builder. Yeah, so specifically for those of you who are less experienced in terms of marketing, what a landing page builder is, is um, a single page site that your leads or customers in the purchasing process land on, which gives them an opportunity to make a purchasing decision, whether it be a product from a e-commerce seller or a local service that a salon, for example, is offering. And the landing page should pro provide specific information on the product and or service that you're selling. Um, and the end purpose is really to incentivize the cu customer to purchase your product and or service right there on that page, right? And the process of the uh, customer actually going through the purchasing um, process is called conversion. Right. Okay, so first to start off, um, we are gonna find a name, right? Um, and finding a name, now that we have an idea, we needed something that is going to um, go after our, our company values, right? So first we need to define our company values, come up with a name, and then from there we can go on to the branding behind it, right? So while coming up with a name, we want to look for um, action, brevity, and speed because those are things that we want in our landing page builder, right? Knowing that a landing page should have action uh, because landing pages are all about calling on a customer to take action on a particular objective, right? Uh, whether it be booking an appointment or buying a product. Um, and brevity, because we want the landing page visitor to have a smooth and brief experience that is impulsive, uh, that, that you know, will impulse a purchase instinct, uh, you know, and it's very important to capture them. 
um, as a purchasing customer. Now, speed is obviously very important as well. And we know that for every half a second that a customer waits for a web page to load, um, about 15% of them exit off of the page. And, you know, that's why this landing page builder needs to be fast. Yeah. And, you know, in defining these company values, we really thought about the features of a great landing page, right? And here's a great exercise into differentiating between a good B2B marketer and a great B2B marketer. A good B2B marketer defines their company values and their brand messaging based on what customers want in their software. Right. But a great B2B marketer defines company values based on the customer journey and the experience for the end consumer. So don't just think about what someone designing a landing page might want um, when coming up with your company values. Think about what your customers, customers want in a landing page when they visit it. Yeah, that's that's well said. That's well said. So then we're going to move on. Um, and this is the name we came up with, right? Uh, it was Swift Pages, and that's because it meets um, all of our company values, right? Action, brevity, and speed. Um, and you know, we wanted to throw in a few other things, such as results. Uh, it needs to be easy to use and modern, right? Um, all the, the the themes and landing page uh, templates that are involved with the builder should be modern, right? So as we move on. Um, this is where we get into domain availability. So now that we have defined our company values, right, we came up with a name. Um, we need to check that name against uh, domain availability, make sure that that domain is available, right? So if Swift pages happen to not be available as a domain, uh, then we would probably look at alternative names because we want to keep our domain um, easily recognizable. Uh, and we want to keep it very basic at a .com domain since they're easy to rank and everybody's familiar with them. And uh, I do see someone talking about SEO in the chat, which is really good because we're going to touch on that briefly here. Um, I just like to talk about benefits and what you want in selecting a domain. First of all, it must be very easy and not just easy to remember. It, it must be easy to understand, right? Just at first glance, Looking at that beautiful domain, you know exactly what the software does. It must be notable. That's where the memorability comes in, um, which is also uh, bottom right corner, memorable, that's important. Um, in terms of search algorithm ranking, the reason why we stress the .com ending to your domain is that Google actually ranks your site a lot better and easier if you have a .com because it's easier for their search engine to navigate your site. Um, you want to keep it short and brief. That's really, really important because the longer your domain is, the larger uh, room for error there are for your customers when they type in your domain. Um, and it must be easily brandable. But then again, that relates to logo, and we'll talk about that later. Right. Now, here are a few things to avoid when coming up with a domain. So when you're you know, on your journey throughout searching for a domain, um, first off, let's avoid hyphens, right? Uh, having a domain, say, swiftpages.com is not available, so we go swift-pages.com. That one doesn't look too good. It doesn't roll off the tongue very well when you're trying to tell your clientele, uh, you know, your website. And it doesn't rank as easy as a single word or just a smooth domain. Um, we don't want double letters, right? Double letters often create confusion among the, uh, the end consumer, the person typing in your website. If you have two L's next to each other or three L's next to each other, sometimes uh, you may be missing out on one of those L's. Um, now, having a lengthy domain, something too long, often also uh, hurts you in search. Um, it's also going to... Um, you know, people are not going to be as uh, as willing to type, spend the time to type that domain in if it's too long. And um, just real quick, I see in the comments that Jason asked us, can you give us an example domain for a comedy website, for example? So taking the tips that uh, we talked about from these two past slides, uh, from benefits, easy, notable search, to avoiding lengthy to specific domains, um, James, 
can you think of any, you know, comedy <laughs> website domain on uh, the top of your head? A comedy website domain on the top of my head. How about this? Let's do an example of a good domain that's comedy okay. related and a bad domain that's comedy related from the same name. <laughs> Right. Right. So let's do let's okay, let, let me let me take a little time to think about this, put some thought into it. And then when we wrap up this this presentation, we'll come back into this. Um we'll have a few minutes for like a, a mini AMA. That sounds good. Um and we'll be able to elaborate more on that and hopefully give you some good insight to help you out. But um let us know a little more detail on what the comedy uh, domain is specifically, you know, what it entails, what the comedy website is going to, to be specifically and then we can discuss that in a little more detail but uh, let's hold off on that let's let's get get to that in a second um sure let yeah. me just touch on the sure. third slide um so we're going to talk about logo and logo design for your brand and since james is much more of an expert when it comes to graphics design and logo design i'm gonna let him take over great so you know there are two main shapes of a logo, right? We have sharp logos and we have dull logos, right? And, you know, a dull logo, um, a few examples that I can think of, uh, PayPal, Instagram, and Facebook, as we can see here. And if you see PayPal, for example, um, it's, it's very dull around the edges. It's rounded. There's not sharp edges. Um, same with Instagram here and Facebook, opposed to a sharper logo such as Tesla, WordPress, or FedEx. It's much sharper around the edges. Um, and, you know, WordPress is a good example of something looking for a little more tradition in terms of logo, but also giving off the appearance of sophistication, um, as well as giving you that sharp um, sharpness to it as well. Now, Tesla, for example, is quite quite on the uh, the opposing side, where it is more of a modern, uh, sleek logo, but it is very sharp and edgy in certain corners. Um, but they do have quite a round dullness to the top of it, which is interesting how they incorporate both aspects into that logo. And uh, just to touch on demographic real quick, I think it's very, very important in designing your logo and creating your branding to take who your uh, target customer is into account. Right. And I'm, just, I'm not just talking about the traditional demographic uh, analysis. I'm also talking about things like age. Right. For example, if I was making a product for toddlers and uh, this is an extreme example, if I was making like a toy website for uh, toddlers and my target audience are like new parents, it's probably a bad idea for me to use a monochrome uh, color scale and a very traditionalist um, sort of font when it comes to it. So just, it's all about keeping in mind who your target uh, demographic is and incorporating who your customers are, right? And James always uh, tells me this, you, you can't think like a marketer if you want to market well, you have to think like your customer. And it's sometimes hard for especially experienced marketers since you're so used to that like sales-like um, frame of reference and thinking but it is important to step into a customer's shoes and think about what they want and what's appealing to them. Yeah, yeah, and and after all, the end consumer, um, the end consumer is always always right. So let's let's move on to defining <laughs> defining colors. So here um, we're gonna we're gonna talk more about color theory, right? When involved with uh, your logos as well as your uh, for your company. So when branding your technology um, with color theory, there are some, there are multiple different, different, different colors on, on the, the color wheel, right? Uh, obviously. And, and we have, for example, blue represents more of a calm uh, and, and more security opposed to something like neon. A neon color is going to be much harsher. It's also going to be more of a modern approach to your tech if you're trying to brand your tech with more trying to give off that modern kind of vibe to it uh, neon is, is great um, now pastel uh, having that dullness and innocence to it um, you know creates you, you creates that um, effect as if say you were trying to brand something more traditional or 
back to the, the toddler example, something like that, using softer colors, pastel. Now, we're going to talk more about clashing colors um, on the next slide here. Sure. So just talking about clashing colors for one second. On the color wheel, clashing colors usually refers to colors that are opposing, right? So when we look at this color wheel, it's pretty clear that red and green are uh, clashing because they are complementary colors and therefore clashing against each other. Um, they're very good for contrast, very, very good for contrast, but they don't work together most of the time. That's why we usually don't work with them. But there are scenarios like a Christmas tree um, in which green and red can work together. When it comes to clashing colors, a few classic combos would be red and purple, orange and green, brown and black, purple and yellow, right? They don't really work together because um, traditionally speaking, you would want a nice contrast. These provide minimal contrast, but the colors still clash. Doesn't look good. So um, sometimes it could work, but we generally refrain from using clashing colors. Yeah. Here, go ahead. Sure. And uh, we just wanted to talk about analogous colors for a second as well. They are, generally speaking, the close colors on a color wheel. So if you can look here, um, a great example would be pink, red, and orange because they're very close with each other on the color wheel. They generally give you a very pleasing tone. They're very good for conveying a specific branding. And also, it's very, very important that you get your analogous colors right so that they define your brand personality, right? For example, when we think of a brand like McDonald's, you think of the analogous color palette they have um, of that beautiful, not necessarily contrast, but complement between yellow, red, and white, right? With their slogan, I'm loving it. It's just awesome. It invokes this sense of happiness of whenever you step into McDonald's, there's that like, excitement of red, but also that friendliness of yellow. So analogous colors are awesome to use together um, in order to invoke a sense of brand personality. Um, and we listed some examples here, red, orange, yellow work really well together. Green and blue work really well together. Purple and blue work really well together, especially for software websites and whatnot. Right, so now we're going to take a second and do more of the interactive part of the, uh, the workshop. Uh, we're going to hop into a Canva account and just kind of go through showing, uh, showing everyone how to design just a very simple logo. Um, so what we, what we did here, um, we actually designed um, something that, that took us a few minutes to design, gave us a good idea of what Swift pages represents, um, and has kind of a techie feel to it when creating this logo. So first off, I want to show you, um, you know, I want to give everybody the chance real quick that if you want to follow along with us, you can go ahead and get a Canva account, uh, you know, that you can get a free, free, free account, or if you already have one, go ahead and create a new canvas and we can get started here. So um, without further ado, I'm going to briefly explain, um, just, just kind of demonstrate on how we can create a very simple logo. So first off, um, specifically Canva has uh, a great resource, um, great resources here in, in icons and things like that. And if we simply type in mail, we have a lot of different, um, different things here. If we type in web, we're going to get a lot of different icons as well. So for example, if I choose one here, um, you know, this is one that, that I found that represented uh, the S in, in Swift pages pretty well. Um, then, you know, it has that icon aspect of your logo. Uh, now, what, what I did next was down here, we grabbed some text. Now, simply, um, we can add some text here and we can just call it Swift pages. Um, and move this over a tad. As you can see, Canva is incredibly easy to use, which is, is fantastic. Um, and obviously, if you're a more um, experienced graphics designer, right. you will experiment with things like Adobe Illustrator. Illustrator's great. Yeah. 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 And Illustrator, if you're looking for 
you know, if you're a little more uh, artistic uh, and you have more of an idea on what you're trying to design, um, Illustrator is a great example of, um, of, of a tool to use to, to do so, um, being that you can physically sketch something out, um, you know, sketch it out on paper and upload it to Illustrator, trace it, vector trace it, and then play around with colors and textures and things like that to come up with the perfect logo. So what I'm going to do here is just show you simply what we did here to make this logo. Um, it's up here and then as, yeah, I'm going to remove that since we already have that there. So I'm going to move this over a bit. Uh, now this is a font that I found that fitted um, this icon pretty pretty perfectly with the dots and the style. And we are going to briefly touch on typography in the upcoming slides, but I wanted to briefly go over this here. Um, so if we duplicate this here and then we do pages, we can make this much smaller and just move it over here. And now we have a logo. Um, now color wise, there's so many different colors you can choose. Um, I chose to leave some contrast and uh, go more bold with it. Now, this is an interesting color combo for a brand. Um, it's something you can definitely pull off, but there's, you know, when, when you're coming up with your other branding and marketing material, I would um, definitely put focus into other aspects and, and make sure that you're using some other complementary colors with it. Um, so this is, this is what we came up with here. So what I'm going to do is back into our, our slides here and um, yeah, so these are the these are the outcomes. This is another one we briefly made. It took us a few minutes, um, but as you can see, you can you can come up with a brand. You can come up with um, your logo in in a matter of minutes, really. Um, and obviously, you can spend more time and customize it. Yeah, but absolutely. Uh, gives you this. Yeah, stay on here for a moment. I I personally have like two tips when it comes to designing logo. First, like James said it literally takes minutes to design each one of these logos. So don't be afraid if you don't get it the first time, you know? Take, I don't know, an hour, design five different logos, go to your parents, ask them which one looks the best. Um, it's a matter of trial and error. And that's honestly how you get good at anything. The second tip I would say is don't be afraid to, you know, whip out a pen and a paper. Um, internet designing using software like Canva is absolutely great. But if you are more of a, you know, hand-drawn sort of creative person, that might be really good for you. Just don't be bounded by like, you know, what we tell you or the, any of the limitations that you might run into when it comes to using a software. Yeah, no, that's, 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 uh, that's a great tip and, um, and, and very, very important while, while designing. Um, so we're going to start moving into um, more of the company slogan part of part of your business, right? And branding. Um, and I'm going to let Cheris touch on this um, and then I'll wrap up. Sure. Yeah. Be closing. So in terms of um, company slogans, uh, a couple of tips to keep in mind. First, definitely keep it simple. When you think of the most memorable company slogans from Apple to McDonald's to Microsoft, they're always the simplest sentence that anyone can understand. And by simple, I really don't mean dumbing it down. You know, there's a big difference between simplicity and stupidity. Um, you can keep it simple yet effective, right? Um, use humor and honesty because those are the qualities that most consumers, I would say almost all consumers look for in a brand. They want a transparent, honest brand that's also humorous. Use rhythm and rhyme. Don't be afraid to get a little cheesy, it's fine. Um, as long as it works, it rolls off the tongue, it's more memorable, that's, that, that's what works, right? And consider your target market. This is really, really important because again, at times you have to step out of the shoes of a marketer and really get into the shoes of who your customers are, who your end consumers are, and really consider who your target demographic uh, is when designing your slogan, right? Um, if I was a luxury brand, I might have a different slogan than if I was a fast fashion brand. Um, it's all a matter of who my target market is. Super important. Right. Yeah. And, and I wanted to go over a few examples to, um, to show you the difference 
um, between between different tech companies, specifically in tech, just because um, I wanted to evolve this workshop more around tech, being that the majority of uh, actually everybody here today is working in, in tech. Um, so I wanted to bring up Apple, right? Everybody knows the Apple slogan, think different, very common. Um, and it's interesting because it is relatable, right? And Apple, you know, lives by it. And they're constantly innovating, thinking different among their company. Uh, and it's, it's great to have that and push it to the consumers as well. Um, to share that, share that message. Now, Hewitt Packard, HP, um, their slogan is make it matter. And um, there, there are many different ways to interpret what they mean by make it matter. But um, personally, I believe that it's meant to be interpreted by the meaning that using an HP device, a computer, you know, some of their software, um, it really does make it matter it makes a difference when you're using it um, and they really want to portray that difference as a brand they want to make it matter they want the consumer the end consumer to understand um, how much life is going to differentiate in being better right by using hp and your potential your potential our passion um, is Microsoft. And this is by far my favorite slogan of all of technology, um, technology slogans. And the reason being is that I, I believe this is super powerful in the fact that your potential and our passion, Microsoft is innovating and creating different um, features and, and operating system for their operating system and giving you you know, the ability to build out your potential, reach your maximum uh, potential, and they're using their passion to get you to that point. And just speaking on the Microsoft slogan for a moment, I actually really, really love this slogan because when you look at it closely, it really exemplifies the tips that we just talked about, right? Your and our rhyme really well. And it's, it's about the prioritization of your potential first and then our passion and P and uh, passion and potential obviously start with the same letter. So it rolls off the tongue really well and it makes it much more memorable for a customer, right? And that's really what you want in a slogan. Um, yeah, yeah, you want them coming back, right? And you want them to remember, you want that engraved in their head that they're gonna remember your brand's message, right? So it's very important to think this through and put a lot of consideration into it. Now we're gonna talk a little more on um, consumer psychology. Um, so specifically, we're gonna start off with typography and I'm gonna let Cheris jump into this one. Sure, so I'm a big fan of fonts, typography. I think it's awesome. Um, so we're just gonna briefly overview a few different fonts and you know talk about when to use each of them. So in terms of Times New Roman, that's the standard, right? Across every primary and secondary school in America, everyone uses Times New Roman. And it's like, why? Because it symbolizes tradition. It's the status quo, right? It, it gives a sense of genericism. But sometimes if you're a brand that emphasizes tradition, that's exactly the style that you're going for. Now, maybe you want that sense of tradition, but you also want a bit relaxed feeling. So you go with a font like Georgia, which is a lighter version of Times New Roman with a bit more round here and there, right? And it gives a sense of comfort because while there still is that feeling of identifiability uh, that comes with Times New Roman, uh, it, it, there's some sort of intuitive creativeness when it comes to Georgia and it's really beautiful. Um, and then you use a font like Baskerville to exemplify reliability, right? Because Baskerville's font is used in um, all of the most reliable brands and it's, it's just a great font. Um, use Cooper Hewitt to exemplify something like friendliness. Uh, Luthier is a really interesting and new font. And uh, I, 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 I put it here that it symbolizes elegance because I do believe that it's a really, really elegant font. Um, now, my favorite font out of all of these fonts are Futura, uh, more specifically Futura Bold, because I think it's the perfect combination of symmetry, roundness, and elegance. It's just overall a very beautiful font. Now, when you look at, uh, look at a brand like Apple, they would use something like Helvetica. Uh, they've actually recently transformed their typography into a new font called San Francisco, and it's an amazing font, but it, it, it's, 
very artful, um, but it's very simple. When you look at the corners and the edges, um, there's not much to it, but there's that slight degree of tilt that just makes it so different, yet so generic in a good way at the same time. Um, and Calibri is obviously, um, you know, workplace industry standard uh, for a sense of cleanliness, right? There's no extra bulk. There's no super lightweight to that font. It's just the standard. It's clean. Um, when you want to be uh, building a web page, for example, especially marketing web page, you generally speaking want to stick to one font. Now there's variations to that one font. It can be bold, uh, it could be light, it could be italicized, but I would say max two fonts. Primary, secondary. Yeah, primary font and secondary font generally stick to one. You can bolden it up. There's all sorts of things you can do with it. But um, yeah, most of the bad looking websites that we've seen <laughs> generally employ way too many fonts, way too many images that aren't related. So it's quite important. Right. Yeah. And type typography is a, is a key component to conveying your brand's message. So let's move on to uh, imagery, right? Now, your brand's image um, is very important, right? And I want to touch base on the fact that portraying your company, right, your uh, specifically tech, you know, in technology, often we get carried away with the tech behind it, right? And often, uh, more than more than not, a lot of the consumers, the end consumer may not be as tech savvy, right? Most likely you're creating some type of tech um, for a consumer, for the end consumer to make their life easier, solve a problem, something like that, right? And what happens is that um, often, you know, you get carried away with that and you don't portray um, the simplicity behind the ease of use of your platform. If it is, you know, if that's what you're trying to portray between, you know, behind your, your brand's message, right? So having a human component, right? Mixing with say artificial intelligence or machine learning, but having, throwing that human component into it is, you know, is a life, is a lifesaver, right? It's a, it's a big game changer there, uh, throwing that in there because it makes, people feel more comforted, right? Knowing the fact that robots aren't necessarily running your entire platform, right? Even maybe, you know, maybe they are, but you know, <laughs> chances are people aren't comforted by that, right? So you give them that, that satisfaction, that comfort by throwing in a human element to that. And we'll, we'll hit um, an example on that in the next slide. Now, conveying your brand message is, uh, you know, vital to your image, right? Your brand image and your brand message is very, very important to throw into your image, right? Now, we need to clearly define your solution when, you know, presenting your image, right? When creating and de developing your brand image, you need to have a clear solution. What is the problem that you are trying to solve and what is the solution you know, why is your tech better and what problem is it going to solve? Clearly define that in the image and tie that into the branding as a whole, right? And it's a plus if you can make it interactive, right? So people are immediately um, caught, you know, eye-catching, but also interactive, you know, have animations, throw a little Java in there, you know, have some animations so people are, um, you know, more suspect susceptible to actually you know clicking on something if maybe something has a little bounce or a little animation right so those are some some points that i'd hit when discussing uh, imagery but we're going to touch base more on that um, in a second and this is an example um you know shameless plug we threw our website in here but um i did want to briefly show you what i meant more about the human component and such you know, since we do use a um, lot of AI, especially the core component of our platform is utilizing artificial intelligence, um, we wanted to convey that our platform is smart, but also easy to use interactive and um, clearly helps solve a problem. 
but at the same time, we don't want to scare people away by showing them that it's more um, technology based in, in the essence that we use a lot of artificial intelligence, right? And that generally scares people away um, in the end consumer, especially that our target market is, you know, they're smaller businesses. They may not understand what artificial intelligence or machine learning is, and that may scare them away because it sounds complex. So adding human elements, such as here, where we throw some, some images of people um, with some screenshots of our platform, uh, that's a great way to kind of counterbalance the, the two together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk to you all about the linguistic side of marketing and branding for a second, because I think it's actually one of the most understudied but important part of consumer psychology. So first is persona. Right. On a web page that you're designing specifically for marketing purposes, you really want to make the narrator's persona clear. And you might be saying, well, I don't have a narrator on my website. Yes, you do. Every single paragraph and sentence on your website derives from a narrator. And that narrator's persona better suit your customer's expectations. That means in terms of tone, um, diction, making it very clear who uh, who your customer should be, right? For example, if I was a Toyota dealership and uh, my website was up, I want to probably exemplify Toyota's branding across um, uh, uh, across the last, I would say, 20 years as being super reliable, being affordable, and being accessible to people from all backgrounds, right? So I might want to use shorter sentences in present tense, um, definitely make it so that it is as accessible to people as possible. But if I was instead working at a high-end car dealership, I would want my tone to be a bit more snobbish. I would want to choose larger words for my diction, and I would maybe even consider using past tense to really get that sense of antiquity and um, you know, just brand tradition uh, when it comes to my branding. The second tip I'll give you guys is keeping it simple and like the domain. By simplicity, I don't mean stupidity. Don't dumb it down, right? By keeping it simple, I simply mean don't add any extra sentences that you don't need in your uh, website. Don't add any extra phrases or extra adjectives that you don't need on your website. This is super important because customers glance, they don't read, right? This isn't a mandatory reading assignment. Customers either go on your website and leave with a sense of, you know, I'm probably gonna buy this thing or they leave and forget about it. So keep it simple so that all your messaging is really delivered. Um, another suggestion will be keeping all of your writing in the present tense. Um, obviously there's exceptions like we talked about if you wanna you know, provide that sense of um, antiquity and brand history, like since 1906, blah, 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 has been doing, perhaps use past tense or uh, past present principle. But uh, social proofing is also really, really important. Ideally, we'd like to think of ourselves and other consumers as unique individuals who aren't affected at all by other people's opinions. That's wrong. That's just not true, right? We want to buy something that we know works. And how do we know it works? Other people have tried it. That's when we come into the next point, actually, uh, using nudgy numbers, right? So a great example that incorporates both of these tips would be 100,000 other, 102,000 other customers have tried um, our root beer. For example, just a random example off the top of my head. Um, and I chose specifically 102,000 because, believe it or not, psychological research has showed that nudgy numbers stick to your brain better than whole numbers like 100,000 um, because there's less like association uh, with other topics that remind you of the number 100,000 that might not be related to your specific brand. So you wanna keep the numbers nudgy. That might mean using 52% instead of 50%, right? It also might mean reporting that you have 97,000 customers instead of 100,000 customers. It's just these little things 
um, that really makes a difference when it comes to the bottom turn. But yeah, that wasn't the details. Right, right. Yeah, and uh, I wanted to throw in kind of an interesting fact, um, something I found interesting and it stuck with me and it's something I always look back on um, whenever I'm going into you know, a new venture or branding something. I always, I always take consideration of this, right? And that is that, simply put, 86% of buyers are most likely to, uh, to pay more for a better customer experience, right? 86%. But only 1% of customers feel that vendors consistently meet their expectations. And I feel that this is very powerful, um, considering that the number is so low that 1% of customers feel that vendors consistently meet their expectations. And, you know, the more I, I think about this, um, this fact, I, I, you know, find, um, find a lot of truth in it, right? Because think about it. The last time you got a service or bought a product, did it meet your expectations? It may have met somewhat of your standards, but did it truly meet expectations or go above and beyond your expectations? Chances are they didn't, right? So that's definitely something to take into consideration when, when throwing your brand together. And if you're gonna create a much better customer experience, um, you know, throwing uh, within all aspects of your of your business, branding, um, user experience, UI, UX, everything all together um, creates that customer experience. And it's very important. Very important. And really, you know, um, we talked about how we wanted to center our brand around a number of values, but it's important to realize the principle of show, not tell. Right? No matter how much you tell your customers about how good your product is, it doesn't matter if your product doesn't meet that expectation, right? But that customer experience is so important. While what we, take our, uh, what we tell our customers takes us so far, their experience and feelings, feelings, that's the key word here, in every step of the purchasing process is much, much more important. So I think we will yeah, yeah, so that note. That's, um, that's wrapping up our, our presentation there, um, wrapping up the keynote. And then I think we might have some time. I'm not sure what we're at. Yeah, we should have a little time for a short AMA. Um, and then we will wrap it up from there. So I'm not sure, um, Mahir, how you want to go about uh, the AMA or if we should, uh, you know, how you, how you want to go about that. Yeah, so what I'll first do is I'll start off with like a general question and then we'll go like swap through the questions in the chat and then some of the submitted questions earlier that we got in the form. So I'll start with the first question. So the first question was specifically about Stiddle. It was the question was, what is your advice to high school students who want to start their own business similar to you guys? Yeah, so, okay. Um, what, what I would say is if you're looking to start a startup, uh, in tech and software, something relatable to what we are, what we're doing. Um, one, I would say, you know, execute on your idea. You come up with the idea. Ninety percent of the battle is just doing it, right? Just do it. Um, you know, you're you're obviously um, going to procrastinate a lot. You know, oh, this may work, this may not work. Well, you'll never know if you don't just execute on the idea. Just try it. Um, you may fail. You may not. Um, but half of the battle is just executing on the idea. Now, I think um, it's very important to find somebody that's as passionate about the idea as you are um, and bring on a co-founder. If, if you know people, if you're networking, if you have, um, you know, people that you, you have in mind that may be, uh, you know, that may be interested in your idea, um, Go about them try to bring them on as a co-founder and and get their insight insights valuable and um it's not just insight but again it's the execution on the insight that you get yeah james is absolutely right honestly just do it nike that's, got yeah. it right yeah, yeah nike did get it right that's that's another one of those slogans we go back to yeah you learn by doing and that's i i realize how true that statement is over time you know um there are things that you may learn before your startup journey that makes you feel that you are prepared. 
you won't be once you actually do it. Um, the best you can do is strategically plan everything out before you jump into an idea. And that's really why we hosted this workshop today, right? Everyone else is talking about the technical aspect. Um, here's how to get started on a certain programming language, but not enough people are talking about exactly what to do after you have a great technical product, right? So, um, yeah, and, and I think it's very important um, you know, we, we talked about this in our introductory speech in the open serum in the opening ceremony, and I find it to be vital to your success that one finding your um, finding a problem, a true problem that is presented and coming up with a solution um, and then modeling your tech, you know, after that solution for the problem, I, I feel is going to create much more success with a viable solution for a real problem, right? Don't just make tech for the sake of making tech. Uh, create a solution for an arising problem, right? Or re-engineer, re-engineer a, if a problem and there's already a solution, find a better solution, re-engineer it so there is a much better solution. So I, I think those are, those are very important. Okay, thank you, that was very helpful. So now we have a question about the slideshow you did today. Could you elaborate on search engine optimizations? Someone asked yeah. in the chat. Sure, yeah. So specifically, um, SEO is very important, especially SaaS-related businesses and tech. Um, having your software and selling it as a service, creating, uh, having SEO is vital to getting ranked and having your website shown uh, to your potential consumers, right? and there, there's so many different aspects to search engine optimization. It's not really a one size fits all glove, right? But I would say that um, that specifically, you know, choose your domain wisely, right? Follow some of the tips that we threw in there. On top of that, push content, push out content, um, lots of organic content, set up a blog, you know, blogs are easy to set up, use WordPress, get blog set up, content, 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 blog about your journey, right? Blog about your tech journey. What did you do today involved with tech? What, what, what was, you know, what problems have you faced? What, what was the solution you found to that problem? Blog about it, right? Those blogs will get out there and boost your SEO. That's connected to your domain. That's going to eventually help that out, right? There's so many other aspects. There's meta tags. There's um, all the tagging that's associated with with your, your website itself, on-page optimization, um, as well as backlinking. Backlinking is it's huge for your website as well and, and the, the way that uh, Google ranks your, your website and its algorithm, so. Yeah, so generally speaking, I have three things that I prioritize when it comes to SEO. Content, content, and content. Right. Content is absolutely the most important thing when it comes to search ranking. Right? Google's been out for, what, 20 years now? They've done nothing but try to make their algorithm as efficient as possible at picking up great content. Right, And they measure that by how many people have clicked on your content, uh, what are the keywords that's in specific blogs and eBooks that you're putting out, um, how many people go look at your content for a long time, stay on that page, and then perhaps click another link within your page. Right. So it's really about optimizing your content funnel so that you bring in as many leads as possible and thereby as many clicks as possible and thus improving your search ranking right. over time. And don't just push out content for the sake of pushing out content. If the content isn't, you know, if it doesn't meet expectations, if it's not solid content, if there's not meaning and truth behind it, there's no point in just pushing out content for the sake of content. So. Oh, yeah, let's uh, take one second to address Jason's question about the comedy domain. Um, so he said that the website specifically targets teens. The, uh, it's basically videos of comedy pranks. Okay. And they really wanted to make people laugh. So um, let's think of one example of a good domain name for this specific uh, you know, idea. Yeah, so a domain name. Um... Jason, do you have, what is the name of your, um, 
your what do you already have a website is this something current i don't know if uh we're gonna get this shown yeah. up in time okay i think so um okay we'll just we can move on to yeah i'm here if you have another question um yeah so we got another question from the chat just about stiddle in general sure. so he asked for stiddle was it more important looking at the marketing side of things or the programming side of things for your software okay uh yeah go ahead <laughs> sure. go ahead so okay I, I i say this a lot to people who ask uh which one's more important it's not a question of either or right you're not going to take any idea or any startup anywhere if you you know force yourself to make trade-offs that you don't have to make trade-offs on um take some of the best companies in the world apple like imagine asking apple whether they prioritize their marketing or their development more like it's like no the question is not either or it's why don't you do both um certainly for us marketing is really important because our technology is like in no way shape or form a completely new idea that came out of nowhere right? yeah it's it's not revolutionary it's more of the fact that we're making it the most simplified solution producing the best results right yeah. and that brings us back to that problem solution phase right and and always you know finding that problem and then executing upon a solution um you know is, is very important um but that's that's what i would say i would say for that i don't know if you can get back there she says no this was like for, okay let's just run with the oh, idea okay. of comedy pranks right sure a good domain would be www.comedypranks.com oh, that would be that would be great but that's not going to be available so what <laughs> what i would say specifically for comedy pranks um i would come up with I'd get a big piece of paper or a whiteboard and I'd start writing out a lot of names and related uh, related things to your comedy, right? Specifically, I, I don't know if you're doing memes or you're doing videos or what specifically you're doing, but I would focus on you know, a list of, of everything that you provide, all the content, and then I would start strategizing different names that are related, right? Um, and then eventually you'll start picking things together and then go in and do a domain search. Make sure that domain, it's a one, just a simple domain that matches the name that you come up with, right? Don't add on extra characters to the end of it and make it a dot com domain. Don't make it dot funny. Don't make it dot info. Don't make it dot org. Make it dot com. It's going to be much easier to rank. It brings you back to that SEO. So. Yeah. And remember the things we talked about. Uh, you know, in our workshop, that is, don't use hyphens, uh, don't use wordplay, right? Don't spell comedy funny, it's not funny. Um, just keep it really simple and concise. Um, that's basically it. Miguel, yeah. what do you got for us? Okay, before wrapping up, one final question. What is the biggest challenge you guys had as high school entrepreneurs? The biggest challenge we've had? Um, there's a lot of Okay, I would say time management is is critical, right? Um, especially the vast majority of projects that Cheris and I are a part of, um, including Stiddle, you have your academics, you have everything all together. Managing your time and productivity um, and organization is crucial, right? Get that down, use task management tools like Trello, to set your tasks for the week, right? Set everything specific to what you need to do and what you need to get done for that set period of time, right? Um, keep your communication very, very key. Use something like Slack, uh, record everything, make sure everything's, everything's there to go back on uh, if you need notes later on, right? Um, use calendars for everything, right? Make sure that you're constantly on top of whatever you have do right i'm talking business startup wise i'm talking um other you know other things you're a part of maybe you're involved in sports maybe you're focused in academia whatever you're focused with focus on keeping uh organized and keeping track of your time right time is crucial and in the end time is money so keep that in mind time is important 
Right, thank you. That was really helpful. So I think we're going to wrap it up here because we need some transition time onto the next workshop. But thank you guys for hosting the workshop. I think everyone learned a lot. Thank you. We all had a course, good time. Yeah, yeah well, thank okay, you. So, yeah, mm -hmm, of course. Rolling. Yeah, happy to yeah, so, one. So before ending, we just want to let you know that the next Dave Camp keynote and AMA is starting soon, starting in around five minutes, and the link should be in the announcements page of the Slack. So make sure to check that out, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your hackathon, guys. Thanks once again for hosting All workshop. Right. All right, look forward to seeing everybody at the closing ceremony. So, Definitely. All right, thank you, Mahir. Yeah, All right. yeah, thank you too. Thank you. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.